Good morning and welcome to our RCF Sunday morning gathering. We're delighted to have you join with us. Borida a Kroisa Kanos Ibao. Let us just begin by committing our time to the Lord. Lord, today we recall your faithfulness. Thank you that you walk with us every day, that you're with us in each moment. Thank you that your promises are true and your goodness never fails us. Right now, Lord, we come to you and we lay our lives before you. We worship and adore you with every fibre of our being. May everything within us cry, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. In these uncertain times when things can appear to be spiralling out of control, Lord, Help us to remember that you, the Lord, are enthroned as King forever. Amen.
Hello, my name is Natalie and today we're um, praying specifically for uh, older children um, in our community that have gone back to school and for their teachers as well in schools. So please join me as we just lift them up to God and pray for them. So Father, we just thank you for the blessing of our children. Thank you that they are such a big gift to us. And Father, just lift them up to you today and this morning. Father, for all of those children that have gone back to school anxious and with everything looking so different, Father, just lift them up to you. Father, I pray will you calm any fear and any nervousness. Father, we just invite your protection over them as well as they go into school. And Father, those that are just so happy to see their... Um, their friends again after such a long time we just bless them we bless their joy father just want to speak blessing over our children this morning and may they know that they are loved and that they are protected and that you go with them wherever they go that you go with them into their schools and that you look after them that you are with them Father, we just uh, we just want to lift up their teachers and all the people that work in the schools as well. And um, I pray for protection over staff, over teachers, especially with coronavirus as well right now. Father, I just pray through your miraculous power that people may be protected and that they may sense your your stillness and your peace in the midst of everything that's going on, so that they can be a blessing. Uh, to the children father we just lift up to you the teachers that are in our church as well specifically and um and we know that you go with them and that you look after them and that you look after every concern that they may have we lift them up to you father and then we've been hearing some really distressing things this week about the fire in the refugee camp in in Les Foss. I just want to take some time to to lift that situation up to our God, who is who's above everything and who's able to to do whatever is needed in this situation. So I just want to pray and please pray with me. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. And Father, we lift up the situation to you in Lesbos with people just being out uh, in the street and not being able to go into the towns and being completely unearthed from the place, the only place they knew as home uh, in recent times. So just want to lift them up to you and Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon them. You are the saviour of the human race and we just pray save them. You are the true physician of every disease. And Father, in this dreadful circumstance, would you heal them and give them the medical help that they need? I pray you provide for those needs of those people. And Father, you are the compassionate lover of our souls and you are with us in all our distress and in misery and father we lift up these people to you we lift them up to you and in their distress and in their misery may they know your love and your comfort in jesus name amen this is a reading from acts 13 paul's first missionary journey so barnabas and saul were sent out by the holy spirit they went down to the seaport of Seleucia and then sailed for the island of Cyprus. There, in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. John Mark went with them as their assistant. Afterwards, they travelled from town to town across the entire island until finally they reached Bathos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He had attached himself to the governor, Sergius Paulus, who was an intelligent man. The governor invited Barnabas and Saul to visit him, for he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, as his name means in Greek, interfered and urged the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and Saul said. 
he was trying to keep the governor from believing. Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit and he looked the sorcerer in the eye. Then he said, You son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, an enemy of all that is good, will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you and you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. Instantly, mist and darkness came over the man's eyes and he began groping around, begging for someone to take his hand and lead him. When the governor saw him, what had happened, he became a believer, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. Good morning. You know, one of the things that I've missed the most um, over these past six months um, has been that uninterrupted time for studying my Bible. Now, I don't just mean reading my Bible. I mean properly geeking out. Um, I confess I like to geek out. I want maps and timetables and cross-references and commentaries. And if you can throw a little bit of, you know, Greek and Hebrew in there and maybe a little bit of historical accuracy, so much the better. Where somebody else will get excited and activated in their gifting when all the columns on their spreadsheet add up um, and someone else gets their cup filled up by um, loving people well or passionately teaching children. Um, I confess that one of the ways that my cup gets filled up is just me, my Bible um, and a world of discovery at the tip of my fingertips. And this was awoken in me. I've told you before that I, you know, I prayed sincerely that I would grow to love my Bible um, at a time when I was really struggling even to read my Bible. Um, so just pray big prayers if something like that is bothering you. So it's been so good to get back into Acts and to delve into the history and the accounts of Luke about what happened next. Last week, Pete told us about the assembling of the A-team in Antioch. But instead of Hannibal, Face, Murdoch and B.A., we've got Barnabas, uh, Saul, John Mark and the Holy Spirit. Now, young people are going, who on earth is she talking about? But I know there's somebody out there who knows what I'm talking about. They were sent out from that thriving church in Antioch. Um, a church made up of lots of those people that were scattered from Jerusalem as they were persecuted and had to flee. But also, interestingly, some who had come from Cyprus and from Cyrene. And so Barnabas, Saul and John Mark, commissioned by the Holy Spirit and their Christian and brothers and sisters who'd laid hands on them, they travel a few miles from Antioch to the port of Seleucia and they catch a boat over to Cyprus. And from there, they're gonna sail on into Asia Minor, now um, Turkey, and they're gonna make a circular tour of towns before heading all the way back to Antioch. And this makes up what you might have heard um, called before Paul's first missionary journey. So today we're just going to focus on what happened while they were on the island of Cyprus. But before that, I just want to set a little bit of background. Interestingly, at the start of this chapter, it is Barnabas who is named first. He's mentioned first. He is the senior member of the team and Saul is the junior member of the team. And then there's also Barnabas's younger cousin, John Mark, who's really merely just the assistant at this stage. But I want to talk a bit about Barnabas first. Barnabas is such a great character. He's um, described in the Bible in different places as um, glad, encouraging, a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith, hardworking. And then I would also add that we can kind of infer that he was generous, honest, a gatherer of people, and he really has, as well as the kind of prophetic gift of encouragement, he has definitely got the gift of discernment. Remember, he is the one who brought Saul to the apostles when they didn't believe Saul could have changed. Um, he wasn't believed by the Christians in Jerusalem, but Barnabas was the first one to trust him, to trust the saving and transforming work of Jesus in Saul's life. 
It's Barnabas who goes and fetches him from Tarsus and brings him back to Antioch in the first place. You can look at that in chapter 11. Have you ever thought about the kind of seven or eight years where Saul was in Tarsus? You know, after his conversion on the road to Damascus, um, he actually spent three or so years living in the countryside outside of Damascus and travelling in um, on the Sabbath to the synagogue to preach. But eventually he stirred up so much controversy that he had to escape in a basket over the city walls to avoid assassination. Saul is controversial, uh, confrontational and obsessional. He travels to Jerusalem but isn't accepted by the Christians there, even though Barnabas tries to vouch for him. Only Peter and James will actually meet with him. The others, they don't want to know. And after a few short weeks, he actually gets sent back home to his town, hometown of Tarsus, where he stays for seven or eight years. Now that's a decade in total of ministry um, that has a very slow start and little significant blessing. He doesn't achieve much in 10 years. It's notable that when he leaves Tarsus, he never goes back there that we know of. We don't even know if he ever wrote to the people in Tarsus. He is hugely learned, full of enthusiasm and energy, skilled in debate and argument. He's got this amazing conversion story. You know, these days he'd get top billing at some you know, evangelistic conference. So why did God not use him more in those 10 years? Well, maybe because he had a lot to learn. He needed to learn how to be more conciliatory, um, more forgiving of others, more humble. He needed to learn how to be less confrontational. And I think he needed to work out that he needed others. He needed to learn about fellowship and teamwork because his natural character was definitely one of independence and to be a solo worker. He struggled with mixing with other disciples. You know, we later see him struggling to accept money and hospitality, preferring to work as a tent maker to, to pay his own way. But remember, that also stops other people from exercising their gifts of giving or hospitality. But dear old Barnabas, who discerns God's hand on Saul, travels all the way to Tarsus to fetch him out of his dead end ministry there and to bring him back to other Christians in Antioch, back to being part of a team. And they really do make the A team together to begin with. It's obvious that these two, Barnabas and Saul, have got spiritual charisma together. And um, in the next chapter, when they get to Lystra, people even mistake them for being gods. Barnabas is from Cyprus, uh, from the port of Salamis on the east side of the island where their boat is going to land. You know, in one sense, Barnabas is taking the gospel home, but it is actually likely there's already a growing community of Christians in Salamis. Um, we know because some of them from Cyprus must have taken the gospel over to Antioch to help plant the church in Antioch. Barnabas must have been excited though um, to take with him all that he's learned in Jerusalem and in Antioch and take it back to family and friends um, there in his hometown. So Barnabas, Saul and John Mark land in Salamis, the main commercial centre and the largest city on the island. And in part two we're going to see what happens as they travel the length of the island. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all Seeking you as a precious jewel Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool You are my all in all Jesus, Lamb of
Jesus, my Saviour, Lord and King, died to destroy the power of sin. You are my all in all. You are the one who rescued me, conquering death, you set me free. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Worthy are you, O Lord my God, to receive glory, wisdom, power. You are my all in all. Blessing and honour and all praise be to the King who reigns always. You are my all in all. Welcome back. So the boat has arrived in Salamis on Cyprus. We've only got one verse that tells us what happened in Salamis, verse five. We don't know how long they stayed or even how they were received. There's some people that think it might have been quite hard going in Cyprus. Um, there's no mention of, you know, many people coming to faith um, or anything like that. And some people suggest that it might have been one of the reasons why John Mark um, leaves the other two when they get back to the mainland in Pamphylia and they, he sails back to Jerusalem. Um, young and inexperienced, he may not have realised how hard going missionary work was going to be. But all that verse actually says is that they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. Um, so it was a definitely a place big enough to have more than one synagogue. There was a whole numerous section of what were called God-fearing Gentiles. Now, these people existed before the gospel arrived. Um, they were non-Jews who attended synagogue. Um, they were attracted to monotheism. They liked the idea of one God, not all the different gods, the Greek gods. Um, but maybe they drew the line at some of the Jewish practices. They didn't want to be circumcised, for example. God-fearers included lots and lots of women. 
Um, Josephus the historian tells us that actually almost all women in Damascus were God-fearers. They were synagogue attending God-fearers. Um, there was also freedmen. Now they were people who had once been slaves, um, but then actually once released, they became often very successful businessmen, um, accountants, physicians. Um, and also there were, um, amongst this group of God-fearers, there were um, artisans, soldiers, and even a few very high-ranking officials, maybe people like senators. And this group of God-fearing gentle, Gentiles, um, they emerge as the most receptive group in all of the Roman Empire, um, and they form the majority. Wherever, they, wherever Paul and um, Barnabas go, they form the majority of the new believers. Um, you can see what is also great is that they form a bridge um, and a network of contacts to reach into the much larger Gentile um, communities in a city. So later, Paul is always known for first going to synagogues um, in a new town and he proclaims Jesus is the king of Israel um, and the nations and all the nations, all the non-Jews as well. Um, we see that when he writes to the Romans. Do you remember that verse about where it says to the Jew first and also to the Greek? You see, Jews would probably have rejected him out of hand if he'd gone straight away first to the Gentiles. Salamis was known for having the largest agora or marketplace of all the colonies in the entire Roman Empire. So Paul may well have set up temporarily in the marketplace um, to fix awnings or tents uh, while he was talking to people about Christianity. Anyhow, by verse 6, they're on the move again, um, travelling through the island and ending up 90 miles away um, in a city port uh, on the west side of the island called Pathos. And whilst Salamis is the largest city on the island, and Paphos is actually the administrative centre, being the seat of the Roman government on the island. And Paphos was also um, a worship centre for Aphrodite. You might know her as Venus, um, the goddess of love. And there was a large temple um, dedicated to her worship there. You can still go and see the remains of that on Cyprus. The island was governed by a Roman proconsul called Sergius Paulus, and we're told that he was an intelligent man, sensible of sound understanding. And one of the clues that the Holy Spirit is definitely the fourth member of this team is that the Holy Spirit is already at work. I can't imagine Barnabas and Saul uh, marching in to demand an audience with the proconsul. That probably wasn't part of their plan at all, but the proconsul sends for them. An amazing open door. He wants to hear the word of God and their reputation precedes them. One of the amazing things that highlights the historical accuracy of this account that I found whilst researching is that the archaeological ruins um, from the proconsul's house can still be visited in Paphos on Cyprus. Um, they've actually even found the plausible meeting room where Sergius Paulus would have held audiences with folk. And, you know, you can pop it into, if you look up here, you can see, pop it into Google Earth and um, you can see it. Look at that. You can actually check it out. He's even got a fountain in the middle of his atrium courtyard um, or alternatively deep baths that you could stand in which just makes me wonder did they jump in uh, you know was he baptized there um, into the faith I mean I can't imagine Paul doing anything else but I'm jumping ahead before Sergius can come to faith there is one obstacle a false prophet or sorcerer called Elymas now, Elymas is part of the group of people that Sergius Paulus surrounds himself with. And he would have been somebody that was into healing remedies, amulets, um, spells, astrology, um, basically a peddler of falsehoods um, who made things up to manipulate others and to benefit himself. He not only fears the influence of Barnabas and Saul, 
um, he also senses their power in the spiritual realm and he tries to pervert the truth. He tries to turn the proconsul away from the faith, probably fearing losing his own standing or position. Um, and he tries to put up a wall to the gospel. Um, and then something very significant happens. From this moment, Saul becomes filled with the Holy Spirit and Saul becomes Paul. Stood in front of a ruling governor of Rome called Paulus, he becomes Paulus. No longer Saul the Jew, a Hebrew from the tribe of Benjamin, but Paul, a citizen of Rome, preacher to the Gentiles. And from this moment, Paul becomes the prominent figure of every event. Paul becomes the leader. The roles reverse. Paul and Barnabas, not Barnabas and Saul. Paulus meaning little, just showing how far he's come in his humility and understanding that when he is weak, God's strength is evident. The door had opened when Cornelius and his household became Christians with Peter. But discipling all nations really starts here. There is this power encounter, a contest between good and evil. Paul looks at Elymas straight in the eye and he calls him out for what he is, a son of the devil. Can you imagine the picture? You know, when the Holy Spirit falls, Paul stares at Elymas in the eye like Ezekiel, whose face was made harder than flint when the Holy Spirit fell on him, or Isaiah, whose mouth was made sharper than a sword. Paul fixes his penetrating gaze on Elymas and he tears down the obstruction. You can tell by the words that he uses. Will you never stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Verse 10. Now that might sound oddly familiar to you. He's speaking in direct contrast to Isaiah's words that everyone would have known, which were then, do you remember, quoted by John the Baptist? Make straight in the desert a highway for our Lord. Now Isaiah, when he wrote it, he was speaking to the people in exile in Babylonia that God was coming to rescue them. God is making a beeline for you, a straight path, prepare a way for him. Elymas is trying to make crooked that path, that beeline straight path of the Lord. He's trying to cause obstacle and lengthen the rescue path against the Lord's saving purposes. Elymas is an adversary of heaven. And in a twist of irony, Paul, who was blinded by the light on the way to Damascus in his own encounter with God, now condemns the sorcerer to temporary blindness and the Roman proconsul believes the good news about Jesus. Salvation opens a door in what looks for all the world like a wall. It really makes me want to go to Cyprus and stand in the room in the Villa of Theseus, as it's called, and just drink in the history of where Paul, anointed by the Spirit, and his real mission of straightening the path and tearing down the obstacles between God and all nations began. Friends, don't get in the way of the straight path of the Lord. Don't put up obstacles to God's rescue plan. Put up signposts. The door in the wall is this way. Point to Jesus. He is the way, the truth and the life. Now next week we've got a guest speaker, the week after is all sorts and then we've actually got a mini series coming up about um, what is church. So it's actually not until November the 8th when Geraint's going to pick up the story 
and we set sail again and we leave Cyprus and we go on to Perga in modern day Turkey. And I, for one, can't wait to find out what happens next. Hi, I'm here to remind you that this week is a listening week as part of our missional rhythms where we listen to what God has to say to us um, throughout the week. So while you're listening, if something comes to mind, just pop it onto our WhatsApp group and share with us if you'd like to, of course. Well, that's it for another week. Thank you for joining us. Um, don't forget that the service is available on our website or on the YouTube channel. So please watch again as many times as you want to and we'll see you again next week. Bye.